we're talking integration, social, racial, political. No, we're not talking about political, are we? We're talking about social, racial integration in Singapore. How? How do we achieve it? We know what the issues are. We know what the problems are. We've addressed them previously. But how do we make us all form hands, stand in a circle and like Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson sing, we are the world together? I think we can do some interesting things. And, you know, one thing I do like about all these different diverse people coming to Singapore now is, is I can see cricket on Sunday again. You know, you go to an open field. Indians and, and cricket. It took you 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> You're Aussie. Yeah. You used to be able to play cricket too. I can't um, play cricket to save my life. But go on, yes. Okay, I wouldn't want to save your life. But anyway. Yeah, uh, yeah so, you know, you go out in open field, you'll see the guys from Bangladesh, India. And, and then on the other hand, you go to the cricket club and you see all these Angmors playing cricket at the cricket club. Now, I think it would be really cool to, to start a league in Singapore, for example, where you have the Bangladeshis from Bangladesh, the Indians, um, and and then you know with the, with the English. And I know we're still talking about different races uh, and forming teams, but what happens is that you actually get people who would not normally interact to actually interact. And sport is a great unifier, as we all all know. And you know it'll be great to see these these old. Um, Angmore expat get whacked by these young uh, Bangladeshi cricketers. You know, I think I think it'll, it'll go a long way, and you can actually have a lot of fun doing that. I, I know I will enjoy it, and mm. I am Indian, so it's a bit biased there. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I'm all for that. Of course, the the bigger issue is probably the the mainland Chinese because their figures are much more substantial True. Uh, than the the other races you mentioned. And there are things being done from the top down. Um, one is, of course, the hawker centres. I think 10 new hawker centres yes. in Singapore is a massive, it's a great leap forward. They are a great social unifier. They do bring people together of all races. Uh, I'll qualify that in a moment. But I think the, the building of new hawker centres in the newer estates, you know, because they don't have them, the Pongals and the Senkungs, is very important. It brings families, it brings different races together. Now, that's the government doing its bit. What the people have to do is then sit together. Yes. Because you can go to a hawker centre and you may still see Chinese sitting with Chinese, Malay still sitting with Malay, Malays and so on. But at least they're in the same community. They're in the same space. building at least. <laughs> they're in the same building at least. It's like going back to the Kampong days in a way. Well, it is. Yeah. And, and the HDB are aware of that, I yes. think. Um, I was very critical in the past of the HDB blocks. And I was unfairly critical because these things had to be built quickly. And you live in a HDB now, right? Uh, not anymore. Not anymore. Not. Yeah. But uh, but I was very critical in the early days because they were, you know, they were thrown up in Topo and there were lots of point blocks. Yes. You know. yeah. There were no central meeting places. There were no natural places to congregate. And I think they were aware of that. And if you look at the, the newer estates of Senkang and Pongal, they're much more circular yeah. where the blocks go around a central meeting place, gardens, uh, badminton courts, mahjong. Am I allowed to say mahjong? They're not really playing mahjong, are they? Chinese but, chess, I think. Yeah, yeah Chinese chess, chess mahjong, something. whatever. They're, they're yeah. gambling at the tables. So there's a communal area now. So you have the communal areas in the HTV blocks and you have hawker centres coming. So these things are happening. These things are changing. But we come back to our original point. There's only so much the government can do. Exactly. At some point, you have to take responsibility for your own actions. Look, you're here. You're here making a wage. You've got to integrate. You've got to make an effort. And that doesn't matter whether you're an Angmo like myself or you're mainland Chinese. We've touched on it before, but I think the first point, uh, port of call, if you like, the first social unifier is language. Exactly. Now, I know there are four national languages of Singapore, but the one that we all predominantly speak, or at least try to speak, is English. Yeah. Now, I like the point you've made to me previously about in the old days, you had a smattering of English and a smattering of Malay and a smattering of Chinese and, you know, and, and Tamil and, and the other languages and putting a lot together, you got We by. may do, and you that's got how we got English, actually. Exactly. <laughs> but when you get the emphasis upon sort of uh, RP, received pronunciation, standard English, which no one in Singapore speaks, by the way. No. And uh, this uh, uh, straight down the middle of the road, very polished Mandarin, which also no one speaks in Singapore. Especially if you're from ACS. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Or RI for that matter, even worse. Then uh, you end up having this emphasis on Mandarin and you end up having this emphasis on English and nothing in between. Yes. Which you didn't have before in the Kampong days. So we need to move back, I think, a little bit towards a common ground where we can all kind of pick a little bit from this language and a little bit of that language. And dare I say, you've got Singlish. Why can't a mainland Chinese guy learn Singlish, as I did when I first arrived? You know, you try speaking BBC-type English to an S-League footballer, as I tried, you've got no <laughs> chance. The, the mutts and the demeanors and the arbengs and the aliens will rip you to shreds. So, of course, I had to speak Singlish. So why can't 
a mainland Chinese guy any different to an Angmo guy or a Bangladeshi guy or an Indian guy you know just get by with a smattering of Singlish and I think that's right, the first thing and it'll be much easier for uh, to do that than to learn you know English as it's spoken and I think from that point of view there is the place for good English but there's also a place for language as a social unit of cohesion and yeah. I completely agree with you you know that, that Singlish or a form of that with all these new guys in here would be a great way to do that you know because it gives a basis of communication, a common language. And right. you know, without common language, no integration. Look, if you learn the hockey and swear words, you can get by in any hockey centre anyway, right? So you're halfway there with I'm the swear I'm not sure whether words. you can get by, but you know, you'll be noticed. <laughs> you'll that's be for noticed. sure. <laughs> it certainly, certainly worked for me anyway. But um, no, that, to me, that's the first port of call. That's, that's, that's English or a, singlish, a Singaporean English, if you like. And I think people are increasingly aware of that. I think, yeah. uh, i give you an example, 10 or 12 years ago now when it was Singlish was the work of Satan and it was outlawed temporarily. Uh, I did this... Uh, TV show for me for Media Corp, and ironically, I had to go back into the Media Corp studios and redub my own voice as an Angmo because my voice in the show was too singlish. Wow! So I had to re- an Englishman had to redub his singlish voice into standard English because and that was a ridiculous phase we went through in Singapore where Pachu Kung had to do you remember that he had yes, to learn yeah, yeah. standard English and he couldn't speak English anymore it was absolutely nonsense but I think most Singaporeans are clued in enough to know that it's all about context I used to be a language teacher it's the tools of communication you transmit you receive yes and you hope that the code you use the code of communication that you use it's appropriate for is that appropriate now if i go in and speak singlish in a business meeting i'm finished yes if i go in and speak sa- standard english in a hawker center i'm finished so it's all about the tools of communication which about, tool do you take out of your box to get a particular job done absolutely it's about context is also about connections so it's what's the best way to make that connection in that given situation correct yeah. and as long as you know singlish is a stepping stone to learning English and or Mandarin and or Malay down the track, then yeah. that's fine. But I see no problem with Singlish being the first step for foreign workers uh, to clear, to yes, cross yes, yes. in their communication in fact, process. In fact, I had a, a, a contractor worker on my, on my office and he was from Bangladesh. And, um, you know, he did speak good English, but he spoke Singlish. And you know what? That immediately endeared me to him yeah. because he, he sounded like he was part of the community. Yeah. And I knew he was not Singaporean. He was from Bangladesh. And for all I, all I know, he may go back. But because he spoke in a language that, you know, there was a connection, um, it was, you know, it was endearing. Well, it was. I mean, when I lived in Topayo, you know, the, the guys doing the air conditioning or putting in the fans or whatever, as you mentioned earlier, you know, they're Heartland guys, but there'd yeah. always be a smattering of English there. Always. Yeah, we yeah. could always communicate. Since I've returned, every person who's come to my apartment has been mainland Chinese. Yeah. And it, it becomes a frustrating process. I have to be honest, it becomes frustrating. He cannot communicate with me. I know more Mandarin, ironically, than he knows English. So I'm, But it's not much. Yeah. So I'm trying to, through a combination of miming, looking like Ronald McDonald and my few words of Chinese, to communicate. It just gets frustrating. In the end, I end up having to call friends. You know, uh, Chinese yeah. friends, and, and we translate. He speaks on the phone and he speaks yeah. to me. I've, I've been there. Yeah. And it just gets frustrating. Yes. Yeah. You end up thinking, I want this guy out of my apartment as soon as possible. He's not getting a tip. He's not getting any extra money from me. I'm not going to get him back again. Whereas the previous guys I used in Topayo, they'd come back to my house four or five times because we could communicate. It was the basic tool of human life, yeah. you know? So you actually tip them. I have done, wow. yes. I have really done. Yeah, I always more. tip. Oh, you've got a tip, my friend. You got I tip at the hawker centers when they when they clean my tables. Look, when a, and this comes back to integration again. When a 60, 65 year old Chinese frail auntie cleans my table, you know, I'm a six foot four, one point nine two meter Angmo, it's humbling. Yes. I can't just sit there and do nothing. Yeah. So I either give her a couple of bucks or we have a, a chat or whatever because she'll speak some Singlish as yeah. well and, and she'll speak some hockey and swear words as well. And, uh, and we get by, you know. And this is another part of in, you know, interaction, integration. You know, it doesn't matter what race background they're from. If they're doing a service for me and they're doing it well, I feel obligated to give them something extra. There's nothing wrong with that. Very it's good. another part of integration. Fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. So what else can we do to save the world? To save the world, uh... I don't know. Do away with countries' passports. I agree with that. One Let's have a borderless government. society. How about a border? Well, I've always said that. Borderless, yeah. A borderless planet is the way to go. No, I think, I, I, first of all, I don't think that a democracy, democracy works. I mean, that's my, my yeah. fundamental Five years point. in Australia, I agree. A theocracy. We need a world theocracy. Right. Yeah. With us as leaders? 
Well, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah that could oh, work. Okay. That could work. Borderless yeah. society. But you know what would happen? Everyone would flee Africa, right? Any sort of inhospitable... And they'll go to Topayo. They'll go to Topayo. That's, that's right. That's where you live. Because there's, there's convenience. There's, that's uh, where King Humphreys came from. Yeah, yeah. You'll be like Mark Zuckerberg. Yeah. M- yeah, <laughs> McRitchie Reservoir's there. Hospitals are there. Cinemas are there. So everyone would leave Africa and inhospitable countries and it'd all move to Topayo. So Topayo is the future of the planet. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, but you know, okay, on a, okay, on a back to a serious note, as a Singaporean, I, I gotta say this, you know, the last five years, I'm like 47, I've been here for many, many years, I was born here, as I said, I still feel very much Singaporean, and there have been a little bit of glitch here and there, you know, coming across, for me, especially coming across people who I can't communicate with and who are not Singaporeans. But when I, when I step back, and especially having this conversation and look back at the bigger picture <clears throat> and look at just the diversity coming in, you know, the, the food, for example, you know, you go to certain areas and suddenly you've got great Vietnamese food. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, on the Sundays, you see cricket being played. If I really want to step back and, you know, take away the little annoyances that I, I must admit I have experienced, I wouldn't say that everything's great. But I think we're moving in the, the right direction. So everything you said, Neil, and everything we've said, I think, about personal responsibility, communication, integration, and really ultimately treating each, each, each person as a, you know, as a human being with dignity, I think we're, you know, we're in for a quite exciting ride. You know? The only thing we have to be careful of is overcrowding. I'm not so worried about the mix of races, nationality. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of. It's going to be a fun place. It's going to be a real cosmopolitan city. You know, like maybe ten years ago, I wouldn't say Singapore was like New York or London or Tokyo. Mm. But today, you know, you'll see the, the different ethnic foods, yeah. little cafes putting up, and you know, everyone from the, the 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 expat who comes here to take a banking job to those who come and work on construction site they add to this cosmopolitan and very diverse feeling and that makes me very excited because it it really puts us on the world map as a city as a co- cosmopolitan mm-hmm. nation and that's something that i think a few years from now we'll go we'll go you know we could actually look new york in the eye and say hey you know what you may be the big apple but we're that red dot yeah this is terrible, but I agree with everything you've just said, and that's no good, is it? But uh, no, I agree. I mean, look, on the overcrowding point, briefly, SMRT, if you're listening, more buses and trains, please, and the sooner the better. Um, <laughs> that's one thing out of the way. But you're right. That was the fundamental reason I came back. I wanted my daughter to live in a more sexy city, a more, as I mentioned earlier, like multi-grain yeah. Yeah, type city. <laughs> and that w- actually is going to be the premise of my next book, New Singapore, Sexy Singapore. You know, when I was in Australia, I was Thank reading you. the Newsweek articles, the Time articles, and it was almost like an old girlfriend you'd split up with and she'd had this really lusty sexy makeover and she was flaunting it in front of you and then you're sitting in this drab little hole and there's nothing you can do about it you know you're desperate to reconcile with this old sexy girlfriend she's my wife now i know i know (laughs) and uh yes she's a beautiful woman she is a beautiful woman so that was the reason i came back you know i wanted to make up with my sexy girlfriend and it is a sexy place, and it is a cultural, uh, a sexy, culturally active, vibrant, colourful place. And I think <laughs> sexually active, a sexually <laughs> active place. Well, we need to be sexually active. We've got a yeah, very yeah. small po- uh, uh, we need facility. To bring, we need to bring that one point one. Yes, one point one. Sexually active, please. Two point five. Go. That's right. <laughs> But uh, I'm picturing everyone being sexually active now. What was I talking about? Just yes. close your eyes. Don't look at me. Yes, Singapore. It's your wife. No, Singapore. Sexy and everything. That's right. I've completely lost my thread. No, it is. Sex- no, that's it. I've got it back now. Don't cut it. It's good stuff. Um, it's a sign of affluence was the point I was going to make. We nitpick. We whinge. We whine. Yeah. We moan. The yeah. buses are too packed. The trains are too packed. You know, I've got to queue too much for my food. There's too many mainland Chinese. There's too much of this. Too- that is a sign of affluence. Yeah. If you can step back far enough, you actually realize it's a positive thing. Absolutely. We are no longer worrying about putting a roof over our heads. We're no longer worried about our rice bowl, our children's education, our medical facilities. Most of those things are settled. This is a good thing. Now you're looking for a little bit of diversity. And we need to channel that, that free time and that energy in the right direction. In a positive yeah, way. Exactly. Rather yeah. than just sit back and look at our flat screen TVs and moan about how terrible our life is because our buses were a bit packed today, mm. we should step back and go, actually, Singapore's got a hell of a lot here. And I say this as a foreigner. It's the reason I came back. Mm. You know, you've got the food, as you mentioned. You've got the cultural diversity. Mm. You've got the most sexiest things I couldn't have imagined 10 years ago. You've got a plethora of artistic venues now, theatres, uh, uh, restaurants, bistros. 
uh, fringe theatre, musicals, uh, rock concerts, things that Singapore never had. Or if they had them, they certainly didn't have them in the abundance that they've mm. got now. Mm. We really have become the Monaco of, of Southeast Asia. Absolutely. I have My no point. doubt about that. There is not a city in Southeast Asia or Asia generally that I would swap for Singapore. And I think all these Singaporeans who, who, who bitch and moan about the MRT and the bus and all that, if you stood them up against the wall and said you can pick any city you want in Asia, I guarantee the vast majority of them would still pick Singapore. And on that point, on that point, so would most of the expats and foreigners here. That's why they're here. So we need to sometimes take a step back and think for all this sort of nitpicking, and it's good to nitpick. It's fun. Mm. We should do it. You know, you want to try and make a, a country better. You want to improve it culturally and socially. But it's actually a damn fine country, and that's why we're all here. And I agree with you, five or ten years from now, it's happening now, but five or ten years from now, this will be one of the, the must-visit, go-to destinations in the whole world. Never mind Asia, in the whole world. It will be one of the sexiest cities on this planet. And no one would have thought would have been saying that ten years ago.